reading passage, uh, the passage from uh, verse 29 to 45. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ear, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. Good morning. It's on. Yep, there we go. All right. Well, we have, we are in uh, Luke. Uh, it's funny. It's uh, Luke one thirty nine. Uh, Lori said twenty nine, but I asked her in the back. I said, Lori, are you ready? And she goes, Unless the Spirit moves in me, and I'm I'm told to read a whole lot more. So when you said twenty nine, I was like, Go, girl. You know, what I mean? <laughs> so you're gonna go with it. And uh, oh, it's. <laughs> I figured, I was like, that's okay, because I'm going to have to kind of tell the story in behind so we can catch up here. Um, let's pray and we'll get started. Almighty God, I want to thank you for everybody here. Um, I want to thank you for all the people that braved the cold this morning. Um, but we thank you for that the seasons do change. And uh, while we uh, complain about the wetness and we don't move quite right when it's cold, uh, we'd also be probably complaining if it wasn't a white Christmas. So... Uh, Father, uh, thank you for having mercy and grace upon us as frail people and help us as frail people uh, remember as we go into this Advent season, as we continue uh, on our journeys, that we remember this is the time where we celebrate you sending your son to earth, uh, our king to uh, a trough to be born. And we thank you for all the miracles that were there the miracle that would go on and take place 33 years later in the crucifixion and the resurrection, and the miracle that you continue to provide in the power of your gospel through the redemption of our lives as redeemed children of God. We thank you for all of this and ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord my God. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Hey, uh, just uh, some things I want to make sure everybody's strongly aware of. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, myself and the board will be meeting about the building. We are still going forward. Uh, we don't say a lot because there's still things we have to decide. Uh, and the major topic uh, John and I connected this week that we'll be discussing is uh, how we feel about debt if we cannot raise uh, in a three-year pledge the whole 800000 So please uh, pray for the board uh, and myself about that as we go forward. And uh, please pray for me. Tomorrow I'm going to meet with uh, a spine doctor. And uh, I think we're going to go forward and have surgery with that. So if you could keep us up in prayer about that, that would be just wonderful because I'm tired of walking like I'm 78. So that would be great. And now we're going to move into uh, what we're going to continue. We're almost done. This has been a long series, Trust the Journey. And uh, we've talked about these different things you need on the journey. You need patience. You need uh, perspective. You need encouragement. You need all these things on the journey. And we've always wanted everybody to continue to remember one verse, Proverbs 4, 18. The path of the righteous is like the first light of dawn and it shines ever brighter to the full light of day. So every day doesn't get better. Every day gets what? Brighter. And then once it gets brighter, then it gets better. Okay? And if we stay on that journey, God's desire for us as individuals, us as a fellowship, is for every day to get brighter. Okay, and once it gets brighter, it does get better. And we do need all these pieces that we've talked about throughout uh, these past two, three months for it to get brighter. And uh, what we want to talk about today is out of all these things, okay, whether it was uh, perspective, whether it was encouragement, humility, patience, asking, whatever, it takes people to do that. Okay, 
And we're finally to the point where we're just strictly going to talk about people because we all need people in our lives. As Pastor Nate read from the proverb, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion, a companion of fools suffers great harm. So as I read this passage, God really laid something on my heart today. You know, what is a wise person? Who are the wise people we run to in our life? Who are the wise people you run to in your life? Or who are the, <laughs> maybe it's easier if I say, who are the fools in your life? Okay, you can itemize that one a whole lot better, okay? And uh, it's easy for us to identify the fools, but sometimes if we hold this text up to the standard of a wise person, okay? And I'm just, I'm, I don't want to add to the text, but I really think there's something here to study about Elizabeth as a wise person who helps Mary grow wiser along on her journey that we can learn right now during the Advent season. So Lori puts us right back into the context. If, if we did pick up in verse 29, okay, what had happened there is the angel Gabriel comes to Mary, and Mary is a virgin, and Mary's uh, pledged to be married to Joseph. She's a virgin. And the angel comes to her and says, you know, I bring you tidings of great joy. Uh, the Holy Spirit is going to give you a child. And she doesn't understand. And then he just says, look, you're going to have this baby. You're going to be carrying the Son of God. And she says, I'll do it. Okay? And so then she has just been told she is going to carry the child of God. God in the flesh. And I would suggest to you, I don't want to call it a problem, okay? I want to say, who do you run to with a problem in your life, okay? Because pregnancy, I've been told, can be a problem at times, but also a blessing, okay? I, thank God I've never had to carry a baby. I just look like one, like I do, okay? Um, but I've been told it can be a problem, but it can be a blessing. But I would believe, if I was married 2,000 some years ago, okay, and an angel came to me and told me the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God would impregnate me, and I'm a virgin, and I'm pledged to be married, and now i got to figure out what I'm going to do about this. I would need a little counsel. I'd probably need a wise person in my life. I probably need somebody to tell me what to do with this amazing thing I've just been told about, okay? You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to go to a fool, okay? Somebody I don't trust, somebody who, you know, is a moron and be like, hey, guess what? An angel came to me. Gabriel, he spoke to me, Tom. Can you believe that? And I am carrying, as a virgin, pledged to be married, the Son of God. High five. Yeah, okay? <laughs> You wouldn't go tell a fool that, all right? There's no way. You wouldn't tell Uncle Phil that on Christmas Eve. You don't do that. But there are some people in our life that we do run to. And if you don't have those people that you run to in life, by the end of this, I want to make sure you have a person or you are becoming a person to run to so you can stay on your journey and every day can get brighter or so you can help somebody else stay on their journey journey so every day gets brighter. And that's the first thing I want us to look at verse uh, 39. It says at that time, so right after Mary hears this, Mary got ready and she hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Very simple, okay? I want you to notice just a couple things here, alright? At that time Mary got ready and she hurried to the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. Now, <clears throat> there's a lot of things here, but the big point I want you to get is we tend to run to, okay, if we are going to run to a wise person, we tend to run to a wise person because they understand something. They can relate to our situation. Now, if you go back and you read the first cha chapter 1, verse 1 through 25, that's not a story about Mary. It's not a story about Joseph. We talked about Joseph last week, okay? That's not that story. See, that's the story of Zachariah and Elizabeth, okay? Now, Zachariah and Elizabeth, I won't take for granted that anybody does, doesn't know this story because Elizabeth very much knows about miraculous births. Zachariah is a priest out in the hill country, okay? So he's a temple worker, if you will. And he's uh, in the community. He's an older priest. And his wife had been barren. His wife was Elizabeth, okay? And she had been barren her whole life. Now, you have to understand at that time, what would that have meant? At that time, what that would have meant was people probably would have always second-guessed her husband. They always would have second-guessed his job 
as a temple worker was to work the sacrifices. And the sacrifices were there to atone for our sins. Okay? But you had to go through all this ritual cleansing to be pure enough to make sure that these sins were actually atoned for. But see, also, when you could not conceive a child at that time, you were considered to be, what? Cursed. So, they were probably the people that walked around town. Everybody's like, do not go to their church. You know what I'm saying? The, the pastor's got something going on because they can't have no kids. I mean, that, that's exactly probably what had been going on in their life. And they're well advanced in years. And they've basically given up on the idea that, that they have children. They've probably been beaten down their whole life. Now they're probably those resentful pastors that don't like anybody. And so he goes in. He's chosen to go to temple uh, duty one day. He goes into the temple to make an offering. And bang! Here comes an angel. And the angel comes to him. And he says, Zechariah, I've heard your prayer. Yeah, I woke you up, didn't I? Okay? Gary, you told me to wake you up. You said you were going to take a nap during the song. You said, wake you up. I've been doing that just for you. All right, so he comes in. He tells Zachariah, your prayers have been heard. You're going to have a child. You're going to name him John, okay? And when, he, he, when Zachariah hears this, he immediately does what all men do. He doesn't just take the good news and run with it. He has to ask questions. And the angel doesn't like that. So he's like, you know what? Since you're questioning me, since you won't shut up, and since you lack faith, stop talking. And he can't talk anymore. I know, right? It's a women's dream. Okay? <laughs> he comes out, he can't talk, and all of a sudden, you know, he goes home, and I don't know if, if it was like super Viagra, I don't know what happened, but he uh, gets Elizabeth pregnant, so she's pregnant, and she has a wife who can, or a husband who can't talk. What a great deal! Okay? So... This is what happens in her life. She knew she was past childbearing age. She knew this couldn't happen. And she knows something happened to her husband because he can't talk no more, which is just a double dream. So she feels double anointed right at this time of the year. It's like the early Christmas presents, okay? And she got double gifts. So she goes to this. Now it does say that she hid out for five months. Why do you think she hid for five months? Probably because she was confused. She was confused. What do you mean? My, my husband can't come home and talk. All of a sudden, I'm pregnant. What's going on here? And then finally, after she's worked this stuff out in her own light and in her own time, okay? After she has reached Sabbath, like we talked about, after she's rested, after she's reflected, after she has seen every day truly has gotten brighter, and because the days have gotten brighter, now they've gotten better, then it says at the end in verse 25, it says, the Lord has done this for me, she has said, in these days he has shown me his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. For five months, she had to work this thing out. Five months, she had to work this out. And finally, she says, the Lord has taken away my disgrace from these people. How hard must that have been for her to have to go through all that disgrace year after year, knowing that her husband had been faithful? You know, sometimes it's really hard to be faithful. Is it not? It's really hard to be faithful when you're all alone. I can't even begin to explain to you. Yesterday, Saturdays, I go down to the jail and I, I meet with different uh, people who are incarcerated. And this, this young man who came here for, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks before he went away. And uh, he told me this story yesterday. He said for the first three months, almost three and a half, he was in so this solitary cell, locked down every day. And this guy put a note under his door every day. It said, just kill yourself. Every day. Just kill yourself. Every day, just die. Every day, just die. Every day, you should die. And he's just weeping as he's telling me this story. And I, 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 I'm astounded that he went through that. But, you know, they're having a little revival in cell block, cell block B down there. Because I tell them, you know, every day gets brighter. They have to sit down and they have to recount that every day as cellmates. And you know what else they do, by the way? Side note, it's really interesting. All the illiterate people down there now know how to read because we've been giving Bibles to all the people to teach them how to read when they go down there. So I just want you all to know that little side note, which is pretty awesome, okay? But this young man had to endure that. He's a trustee now, and he got prepared. And I looked at him yesterday. I said, Eric, you know, he said, why would God allow that for me to happen, Pastor? And I said, Eric... I'll tell you why. Because you're going to be an Elizabeth. Because I know I'm talking about Elizabeth today. I was like, someday, somebody's going to come to you. 
Someday you had to endure that for three months. But someday somebody's going to come with something much bigger. They're not going to be as strong as you are. And they're going to need you to speak into them. They're going to need you to encourage them. They're going to need you to speak life into them. Because they will not have the strength you had to make it through that time. And it was all like, boom, his day got, what? Brighter. So we run to those people like Elizabeth. Now how would Mary know that? Well Mary, okay, here's the cool thing. Mary's related to Elizabeth. So now we skip back to Mary, okay? So Mary finds out she's pregnant without any conception. And who does she run to? She runs to her relative who also has had a miraculous conception. Makes sense, right? We tend to run around and be with people who have been through the same problems we've had. We go around and we be with people who have been through the problems we've been through. We go around and we hang out with people who have done life with us. I don't run around when I have a problem and dump my problems on somebody I don't spend time with. And I don't run around and dump my problems on people I casually see. I run around and I share my problems with people that I know I can trust. I know that are willing, if I give it to them, they're going to walk with me. They're going to be good stewards with that. They're going to cheer me on along the way. They're going to understand my problem. They're going to understand the uniqueness of my problem because they, can, because they understand the uniqueness of my problem. They can speak to the uniqueness of my problem. Are you hearing me right now? Because that is exactly what Elizabeth could do. Mary's going to come in. And don't you think the whole way that she's hurrying through this country, why do you think she's hurrying? Okay? I think a lot of times we read the Christmas spirit into this. And I've had to deconstruct some of this stuff for you guys at times. Okay? I, I think that she very much might have been hurrying to her above all people because she would have been afraid. I very much believe that. She didn't want people to know. She would have been accused for being a whore. She could have been stoned. There were all these things. And so she runs to the one person she knows in her family that's been with her throughout her whole life that she knows can speak to this problem or this concern or this confusion she has because she's going to walk with the wise and grow wiser in the process. You've got to take a lot of wisdom, okay, to raise the Son of God. It takes a lot of wisdom just to raise any kid. Amen? Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> you know, in the spark thing yesterday, I was trying to call Kristen. And uh, I kept calling and calling and, and like the Corbin plays at the phone. He answered it. Okay, he thought that was funny, and uh, it was on like a you know the video screen phone. And I'm talking, talking. I'm not getting. He's just like, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Doctor Sharp pops up in the screen, and I'm like, what is going on here? And they, she had gone with Kristen and the kids for uh, um, uh, the Spark thing down in Wolkerville. So Kristen comes in a few minutes later and she goes, yeah, Rhonda don't want to be a grandma anymore. She's <laughs> it's hard to raise children. Can I get an amen? Yeah, okay, so you imagine you're going to carry this son of God. You want to be around somebody like that. We want to be around people who have been through our problems, okay? The one thing Kristen will never let me forget, okay, we had just got married. And oh my goodness, this is why health insurance is such a pain in the rear. And I learned my lesson at an early age. We had just gotten married. I'm in this gap before, you know, that gap, the gap. You know, everybody knows what I'm talking about where you, your insurance gaps and life just falls apart at that point. Well, I was too dumb. I, my parents, my parents were telling me like, buy Cobra insurance, get Cobra. I'm like, I'm not. I'm 22 years old. I don't need health insurance. That's a scam. You know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? I'm married to Kristen. We're about to go to Alabama, and uh, I'm I'm playing softball in like a city league. And if you can't tell, I'm intense at everything. Okay, and it's practice, but I practice with intensity, and I'm playing shortstop. And Chris and I have been married for like three, four months at this point. And somebody hits a ground ball. And I was much thinner and much more limber back then. And I dove and I put my hand down. But I was, I'm 220 pounds now. So I was probably about 200 pounds then. And I came down and I kid you not, my whole thumb just like snapped back. And I knew it, but I couldn't see it. You know what I'm talking about? Because the glove was on my hand. And so, like any moron, I, I, I pull the glove off, 
and I see my hand kind of like over here and the skin split and I'm like oh, 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 oh. and I look up and I see Amy Law now Kristen's playing third base but I'm looking at it in center field because I dove out there I see Amy and I look at my hand and I just run to Amy and I'm like Amy I mean, my hands, I mean, it was disgusting. <laughs> and I run out, and she's trying to tell me what to do. And we get in the car. We're not even waiting for the ambulance. And Kristen is just driving with intensity. And I'm like, baby, pray for me. She's like, I can't pray right now. And I think she's intense about getting to the Elkhart General Hospital. And we're just I'm like, hurting so bad. She's like, you hurt me. And I'm like, what do you mean I hurt you? She's like, why did you run to Amy? And she still remembers to this day that I ran to Amy and not her. But listen, okay? I dated Kristen and married her within just a year, okay? So at this point, I've known Kristen for 15 months. I've known Amy for 15 years. I used to party with Amy. Amy and I got saved together. I remember when Amy's fiancé got killed by unfortunately I hate to say this but by two Amish girls who stole a buggy and her husband or fiance was driving back to Tri-State at the time and he drove a little Fiero and the horse clipped out and <laughs> killed Jeff I remember that I walked with that we got saved together went to church together the point is is we had done life together we understood pain together and sometimes when you do life together you have pain together you cry together you laugh together. You have fellowship in Jesus Christ together. Sometimes you're going to run to somebody aside from your spouse. Now as long as you ain't doing nothing wrong, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Okay, now I'm also not suggesting any of you go out and break your hand. Okay, but don't be ashamed. Now it's best to stay male to male, female to female. But make sure you have somebody or ask yourself, do you have somebody in your life when a catastrophe happens that you can run to that can relate to your problems. Do you have somebody like that? Do you have somebody you know understands your deepest, darkest problems? And don't ask at first service like, problems are behind us. We've got grandkids now. Or our kids are in college. Well, oh, no, I know a lot of you. And y'all got problems too. Y'all got problems too. Which brings me to the next point, okay? Because I think that's just as important. We've got to have people to run to that understand our problems. And Elizabeth would have understood Mary's pregnancy problem. But also, okay, our problems and act can actually draw people closer to God. Check this out. It says, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Now, the baby in Elizabeth's tummy is who? John. JTB. John the Baptist, okay? And this is the only time that a Baptist will ever dance. So understand that, alright? <laughs> and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, alright? So as soon as Mary comes in with her greeting, it says the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was what? Filled with the Holy Spirit. It, okay, that is a crucial conjunction. And she was filled with the Holy Spirit. Her life changed spiritually when the Holy Spirit came in her. Do you understand what I just said? Okay? When the Holy Spirit fills us, our life changes. It's a mark of our salvation. It is God living within us. Okay? And it says, In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed is the child that you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Now listen to her, okay? As soon as Mary comes with her problem, Elizabeth's life changes. I'm going to say it one more time. As soon as Mary comes with her problem, Elizabeth's life changes. She grows closer to God. We know she grows closer to God because it says she was filled with the Spirit. We know she grew closer to God because we know that John the Baptist just leaps up in her womb. We know Baptists don't leap up in wombs, okay? And then the other thing, it was not say she says, the mother of my what? Lord. She, how, she hasn't come in yet. She didn't get like a Facebook post that, hey, I'm having Son of God coming to see you. She didn't, you know, text her and be like, 
Gabriel came, told me, Jesus is in my tummy. Uh, I'm coming to see you. I'll bring some sweet potatoes too. You know, like none of that happened, okay? There is something that God miraculously does in Elizabeth's life the moment Mary decides to run to her, one, because she understands her problems, but two, I need you to understand this. When people bring problems to you as the wise person, do you know what it does? It forces you to grow closer to God. It allows you the opportunity to draw closer to God. Now that's a mindset, isn't it? How many of us spend hours, hours, days, weeks of our life avoiding family drama, particularly right now? Right? Don't act like you don't. You're like, oh no, my aunt texted. I don't know. <laughs> we, avoid, we, we avoid it like the plague. But what if, what if we took the mindset that when people bring problems to us, that says what? One, they trust us, right? There are a few people, two or three people in this room that I bring every problem to without one bit of hesitation. Do you want to know why I bring those problems to those people? Because I know they'll be prayed for. I know they'll be, I'll be encouraged. And I know they'll be given wisdom. And I know they will shut up and listen if I need to talk. But the most important thing is, is I know they will draw closer to God by carrying my problems. And a lot of times, we do the other side, okay? Let's say we're the one with the problem. We're the one with the drama. A lot of us have a self-awareness like, well, I don't want to bother Linda because I know Linda's having hip surgery next week, so I don't want to bother Linda, okay, with my problems. But if I, if I remember that my problems can actually allow Linda to draw closer to God, because when you have your hip surgery, sister, you just get to lay and pray. I mean, that's all you get to do, right? So you're the best prayer warrior we got the next week. Tag you in. Uh -huh. All right, every phone call comes in, go closer to you. You go closer to Jesus in the process. Now, doesn't that, if you think differently, okay, if they change your mind about problems in your life that people bring to you, and you're like, keep them away. Don't answer the door. And you never ring the phone. And you're like, oh, my voicemail is full. You know what I mean? Like, all those things. What if you actually said, no, if I carried these problems, it will make me spiritually stronger in the process. How would that change the way we think, right? Boom, the day just got brighter. We wouldn't spend so much time hiding and hoping that people didn't bring their problems to us. We'd start seeing with the light and go, wow, John really believes in me. Brian really believes in me. Eric really believes in me. My dad really believes in me. Or they wouldn't have brought me this problem. And this problem is too big for them, and it's probably too big for Ben. And so you know what? Ben gets to lift it up to God. And if you lift something up and you hold it up with your hands, guess what happens? It gets heavy. But you know what? When it's heavy and you keep holding, what happens? You get what? Stronger. You get stronger. You get more fit. You get more spiritually fit in the process. And that's exactly, I think, what we can see here out of Elizabeth. I think that's the wisdom in what Elizabeth has, okay? Our problems, and I want you to walk out of here with this one, okay? Because some people walked out with the Sabbath thing a couple of weeks ago. They're like, when they took, heard me say, you know, go home and take a nap. Everybody was like, yeah, I'm napping for Jesus, okay? Like, no. <laughs> but I do want you to think about this, okay? I want you to think that one of the greatest gifts... How many of you are worried about getting a gift for somebody right now? Anybody? Oh, good night. I'm the only one worried. Okay, thank you, Julie. All right. Spoken like a grandmother. I, I'm, I'm terrified. I haven't gotten any of you anything. Okay? That includes my family in the room. All right? So... <laughs> yeah, you ain't got nothing yet. So... <laughs> I won't get anything. I'd add a boy to prayer. So... When you are like, what do, I, what do I give Ryan for Christmas? At the last minute, you'd be like, Ryan, I didn't have enough time to get to the store, but you know what I'm going to you, give you? I'm going to give you my problems. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Any time? That's right! Best gift you can give. But why is that a good gift? It's a good gift because it says, I trust you, Ryan. It's a good gift because it says, I believe in you, Ryan. It's a good gift because it says, I believe you're wise, Ryan. It's a gift because it says, I believe you're my brother, 
Ryan. Please, I trust you, Ryan. And I know, Ryan, you will become spiritually closer to God when you take this problem and carry it up for me. And it will change you spiritually in the process. It'll change me. It'll change you. Amen. Amen? Amen. So, when we're looking for wise people, we want to find people that are what? That can understand our problems. Two, what else do we want to do when we find wise people? We want to find people that are going to go close to God. They're going to be changed in the process. You are actually giving a gift when you give your problem. Now, I'm not talking about foolish problems. It's not real problems. You are actually investing in people in the process. So don't withhold your problems when you're offering them people. Just be wise about the people you give them to. Give them to wise people. Now, the last point I want us to see really quick here is that our, when we have problems or whatever you want to call this, okay, wise people tend to be on the positive side, okay? I've never seen a whole lot of wise people that are just mean and crabby, okay? Now, it doesn't mean positive like Tony Robbins or it doesn't mean positive like Ben, okay? It does mean, though, that they tend to be an encourager. They tend to be positive. They tend to cheer you on along the way and give you encouragement in that process because at the end of the day, the wisest person knows this. They know it's about approach. They know it's about how you say it. They know they're not going to lie to you, but they're going to speak life into you and encourage you in ways that you're never going to know and they're going to be your biggest fan in the process because you have to put yourself back in Mary's shoes when she runs to Elizabeth, okay? She's running away knowing she could probably be accused of an affair. She's knowing she's running away probably being accused of a liar. She's blowing, probably running away thinking, how am I even going to explain this? At least Elizabeth and Uncle Zachariah got it on to have this baby, even if, they, you know, they were old, okay? I didn't even have that. And she's trying to craft her story the whole way as she's going along. And as soon as she walks in that house and gives a greeting, all of a sudden, what does Elizabeth do? Three different times. Verse 42 says, in a loud voice. Okay, so Ben type. Okay, so she, she wasn't like, you know, hey, sweet, like, come on in, Mary. No, 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 that's not what she did. In a loud voice, she said, Blessed are you amongst women, and blessed be that baby in your tummy. And then Mary says a little bit more, and she goes, You know what? Blessed are you who has been who has believed what the Lord has said, uh, who has said to her, and will be accomplished. Blessed are you amongst women, blessed is that baby, and blessed for you for being obedient. She gives her encouragement at a time when this woman needs to hear encouragement. Is encouragement when we need it most, not just like it's chicken soup to the soul, right? That's what we all come here for at the end of the day. That's the job of a prophet is to encourage people, okay? I don't come here to not give you hope and beat you down. I don't even understand why pastors do that. I want people go out and feel encouraged by Jesus Christ and know the love of Jesus Christ. Now, between that love, I don't want people to love to death that they forget sin, okay? My dad showed me something the other day, and I have to remember it, okay? There is law and gospel. There is grace and truth. There is those of us who lived the wooden spoon years of our lives. Anybody here a survivor of the wooden spoon? Mm-hmm. Can I testify, all right? You got to have the wooden spoon to appreciate the freedom of your fanny, okay? <laughs> like, you just got to have that in life. All right? And so she knows she could be in a wooden spoon moment, but that's not what she is, right? She thinks that. But the first thing out of this wise person's mouth, why is the first thing out of her mouth? Because she understands the problem. She understands Elizabeth's been there. She understands that life can be weird. She understands what it feels like to be condemned by everyone around her. She's been there. She's done that. She's got the t-shirt. And the first thing out of her mouth isn't, come on in, sweetie, and I'll nourish you. It's not, you, what do you mean? She never questions it. She doesn't, like her husband, like, what do you mean, Gabriel? What are you? No, she says, blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed are you. Blessed in the Greek also means happy are you. Happy are you. Happy are you. She's her biggest fan. She's her biggest encourager when she needs it most. And at the end of the day, when we run and we need a wise person in life, what is it we want from them? Do we really want advice or do we want encouragement? We want advice, sure. But don't we want encouragement, really, too? 
I almost tend to want encouragement more than I want advice because I got so much knowledge in my head. It's like, don't tell me one more answer. I got more Bible verses memorized than any of you. I guarantee it, okay? I just want somebody to tell me it's going to be okay. I want somebody to encourage me. That's what I want. My guess is most of us here want that too. If we can learn to encourage like Elizabeth, and out of the experiences we've had in life, we truly will be iron sharpening iron. We truly will be the wise people that the others need. You know, as I was, and, and, and Randy, you and your team can come here, I'm going to close on this. As I was thinking about the biggest encourager I know in my life, hands down, okay, it is my father-in-law. It's his gift. It's, he has a spiritual gift to exhortation. He literally has that gift. And um, this man is a fan of everybody. Okay? There is a, a other... Well, he is not a fan of Barack Obama. But everybody else... Everybody else he's a fan of. That's not me, my political view. I'm just telling you, like, uh, that he's a fan of everybody. So much so... That when we lived in Indianapolis, and he's a very, uh, he's a, uh, a Polish guy, and uh, born and raised, you know, in Buffalo, New York. And he takes great pride in his culture. He takes great pride in the area he was raised in. He's still a Buffalo Bills fan, a Sabres fan. I don't know why, you know what I mean? Like, but he just lives, eats, and breathes his culture and his people he, and his family. He'll do anything for anybody. He just, and he's always encouraging. That's all, he never says anything negative. I think I've talked once. I said well, I put him and Randy Perkins in the room. They literally saw each other, looked at each other, hugged each other, and like Jesus sparks. Okay, like that. It's like that. That's what happened. Okay? And um, so he comes down. This would have been five years ago, right around now. And uh, it was right after Corbin was born. And I used to get these uh, tickets uh, from a guy. Uh, for Pacers games, and they were courtside. They're like three rows back. Okay, so we're on the court, like the folding chairs. We're not in benches, we're on the folding chairs. And it was, it, it was when the Pacers were terrible, and if they were terrible and they were playing a terrible team, I could get them very cheap. Okay, so it looked like I was a big bankroller, but no, I was just going to a lousy sporting event. Okay? And so... I say, come on, but he wanted to go because a hometown boy from Buffalo named Johnny Flynn played for the Milwaukee Bucks. And he played with my nephew, Jared, who my father-in-law raised uh, throughout high school, travel ball, stuff like that. So he wanted to see Johnny Flynn. I didn't know anybody on the Milwaukee Bucks. Didn't really like the Pacers either, but what the hey. So we go, and it's cool to sit like courtside. Like Those guys are way bigger when you sit down there. And you're sitting down there, and the game starts. And... Uh, when they announced the lineup, I knew I was in trouble, okay? So they announced the Pacers, everybody, hey, okay? And so they announced the Milwaukee Bucks, and all of a sudden they yelled, Johnny Flynn! And my father-in-law was like, yeah, Johnny! Yeah! In a loud voice, yeah! No one's there. But remember, we're courtside right next to the Pacers, so everybody's looking at us. I'm not kidding. Everyone's looking. McGinnis, you know, the uh, Hall of Famer, sits like four seats over, he's staring at us, like, what are you doing? I'm like, this isn't going to be good. So we sit down, and uh, they immediately they start, and uh, they go down, and uh, his buddy Johnny Flynn takes a shot, and he, he misses. He's like, it's all right, Johnny. It's okay. And I'm, everybody's looking at us, and I'm like, oh, Lord, no. No. And I kid you not, second period goes off. This guy it goes 12 unanswered points by himself. And Bill gets up and screams every single time, That's my boy, Johnny! Way to go, Johnny! And I mean, I'm ready to see Pacers fans lynch us. I mean, at this point. And I said, Dad, stop. This is Indiana. Basketball is next to Jesus. And he goes, That's my boy. He's from my town. He's my people. And I'm going to cheer him on the rest of the game whether they kick us out or not. Isn't that the kind of fan we want in our life? He'll stand up against 18,000 people and he'll cheer Johnny Flynn on. Every bucket he scores, he's right there. Every shot he misses, he cheers him on. That's what Elizabeth does. Because Elizabeth's been there. She's done that. 
Elizabeth is always open to growing spiritually. And Elizabeth isn't going to condemn her. Elizabeth's not going to ask any questions. Elizabeth's just going to go, blessed are you. Happy are you. That's what a wise person does. Now the question as we close today is this. You got this in your, your thing. I want everybody to take this out. Okay, you got your prayer thing. Or you got this thing. If you, you don't even need to, unless you got a different prayer request, just write this on the back if you don't want to write it there. But put your name on it. Everybody in this room at this point, if you've been patronizing church for a long time, should be wise. Let me ask you, what if Eric left the jail and came, came to church here today? Would you know how to talk to him? Would you be wise? Would you know what to say? You don't have to go to jail to sympathize with the guy's problems. The guy has hurts, habits, and hang-ups. Would you allow him to be wise to you? See, the question I want to put before everybody today as we go into the new year and we continue to move forward with our vision is this. We need to continue to make sure we are building our relationships with Christ. That means personally and with each other, which means we need each other. If your pastor needs people in this congregation that are wise, my guess is, is everybody in this congregation needs also somebody to be wise to or to grow wiser. So what I want you to do on here is write just something, you know, what do you want to do? Do you, you, you can check one of the boxes, okay? Like, do you want to get plugged into a disciple group and be wise, you know, grow wiser in your faith and grow wiser with other people? Do you want to learn personally about your spiritual journey so you can be wise one day? Or a disciple group to be with other people to be wise? Or maybe it's just somebody you want us to pray about that needs wisdom. But don't pass this opportunity by. Okay? We want to see everybody continue to grow closer to Jesus Christ in their relationships. And if you aren't plugged in, then you're never going to experience the true wisdom. You're not going to be able to walk with the wise. If you don't know your spiritual journey and meet with us and talk with us, you're never going to grow wise and you're never going to grow wise with other people. Or if there's somebody in your life, and I know there is in many of your lives, that you want to be wise to, just write down on the back of this and we'll pray for them. You can put that in the offering as they pass it by. As they pass it by, we're going to continue singing, but we're going to continue to stay in the Christmas theme about three people who traveled together who were very wise. Who were those three people? The three what? Wise men. That's right. All right. So as they sing this uh, long-known Christmas hymn, think about that, the wise people. Write down as you take the offering. Would you stand with us?
Let's pray. Almighty God, I want to thank you for everybody in here. And we know uh, there are a lot of wise people in this room. And uh, Father, we all need to walk together. We need to grow together. We need to grow stronger together. We need to be iron that sharpens iron. But the wisest person in this room knows that they need to continue to grow wiser. Which means we all need to continue to be in fellowship with each other. So I ask, oh Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you would move in everybody's heart that says, you know, I need a wise person. Or I need to grow wiser and be prepared for the next chapter of my life. Father, one of the greatest things that you did, that you called very good when you created, was you created people. And people do amazing things. You do amazing things to your people. And every person in this room, I believe you have a plan and a purpose for to do those amazing things. And so I ask God this week that they would find those wise people in their life. I ask God that they would be the wise people they need to be. I ask, oh Lord, that you would send us out during this time, a holiday, where people are alone. Help us remember that people's problems are a gift. Help us to not run from them, but embrace them as opportunities for us to grow in the process. I ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Raise your hands and receive a blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face shine down upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord continue to look upon us all with favor. May the Lord grant to you His peace. Go and have a wonderful day, everybody.